Hello folks, this is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Lecture 11 of Arrow 3261. Today we're going to continue our study into bending and we're going to look at eccentric loads. So let's take a look at how this works. So what we've been doing so far uh, is we have been pretending that all forces on a cross section occur at the centroid. For example, if we have a rectangular section, we're assuming if we have an axial load that it is applied right here at the centroid of the section. If we have an I section, whenever we do P over A, we're assuming that that force is applied right here at the cross section's centroid. Now, if that load were applied somewhere else, for example, if we have the same rectangular section, and let's say that our load is applied down here, then actually that's going to induce a moment. We're going to have to get rid of this force. We're going to have to replace it with an equivalent force system here, which would be a force P. If that was magnitude P, we're going to have a force P, and then we're going to have a moment, and that moment is going to be causing this kind of bending. That moment will have a value of P times E, where E is the eccentricity of that loading. So now we have a new loading with axial load and bending. That's called an eccentric load. If the load were, say, up in this corner over here, then actually we're going to get, let's call this eccentricity X, we'll call this eccentricity Y, and we would get two moments. We'd have MX would be going like this. If we define this, our coordinate system, from right here, X and Y, then this axial force, let's see, it was right here. This is going to give us a moment like this. So it's going to, and that's going to be a positive MX, uh, which is going to be PEY, and it's going to give us a negative MY PEX. Now, in terms of the right hand rule, this is a negative X moment because it's, go, uh, excuse me, a positive X moment, which is going like this, and a negative Y moment. Okay? Now, often when we're talking about beams, we're going to find bending that. A smiley face bending is positive, which means compression on the top. Now this, mx, which is positive for the x-axis, is actually going to be negative if we're using beam sign convention. You're going to have to be really careful with this nomenclature because if you, uh, if you use, uh, because beam sign convention will also often have a different sign, a different sign than normal right hand rule sign convention. So we're going to have to be a little careful with that principle. So today what we're going to look at is we're going to be looking at these eccentric loads. We're going to be looking at eccentric loads because they're not applied at the centroid. We're going to be looking at when we have multiple loads on a section in multiple directions. So this is showing a cross section in figure 439 of Beer and Johnson, figure A. We see a cross section that looks like there's no eccentricity. Because if we look at this end of the beam of the section, we've got a force here and we have a force here, and the line of action goes right here. That means this force is applied to the centroid and there's no moment. However, if we cut this part in half and focus on this half at the left, we find that this force has to be reacted with this force. This force F is equal to the P prime. And we also get a reacting moment, M. We can see that by summing the moments about point C, and we see that there must be an internal moment M, which is equal to PD in this case, in order for this thing to be in equilibrium. That's called a secondary moment because there was no moment applied to the thing, but the moment sprang out of nowhere, so to speak, due to the geometry change. Now, what this means is we're going to have to be alert for moments on our structure. Whenever we are looking for what our stress is, we know that our stress is P over A if we have an axial load, and we're going to have MY over I component. 
Now, this MY over I is talking, measuring that from the centroid. We talked about saying, okay, if we call this MY bar minus YI to any point, what that means is any point above the neutral axis will have a negative sign. We can put a positive here. This formula is using beam sign convention. Right? If we had used right hand rule sign convention on a cross section like this, this would be a positive moment which is causing tension on the top. If we're using beam sign convention, then a moment that causes compression on the top is considered positive. So that moment's considered positive, and this formula gives us the correct sign if our moment is defined using beam sign convention. Anytime we have like this kind of moment, we will use right hand rule because that doesn't fit. It doesn't look like smiley face bending. We're bending it sideways, not up and down into a smiley face. So then we go back to right hand rule sign convention. Mm. Okay, so what this slide is basically doing, reminding us that the total stress is going to be the summation of the actual stress plus or minus the bending stress. And if we use an appropriate sign convention in or a consistent sign convention with the formula we use, then we can just superimpose them. The effect is like what we have is this stress and then we have this stress, which means the stress here is going to be the summation of these two, which means this one minus this one, right? And over here we've got this stress plus this stress, so we can see the one plus the other. In this case, we saw the one minus the other to get the value, which basically has the effect, this axial load has the effect of just shifting, shifting our, uh, shifting our, distribution of stress. If you imagine the distribution of stress is like this, and then we shift it this way, we see it shifted until it was right about there. That's the effect that this axial load had to create this. Okay, so uh, going back, our basic equation, perhaps this is how I should pitch this. We have P over A. We're going to have an MX over IX, and we're going to have an MY over IY. If, and the Y is going to be Y bar minus YI, and if we're using beam sign convention, if the moment is in beam sign convention, then this is a positive side. This That's wrong. So let's just uh, think about this once more. Our total stress is going to be the P over A, talking axial. We've got a plus, and we're going to have an M, uh, let's say the M about the x-axis over I about the x-axis, and then we're going to have a Y bar minus YI. That's that stress. Then we've got an MY if we have one, x bar minus xi, and all that is over iy. Now this one, if our cross section is like this, and we have a right hand rule sign convention like this, then we have the m right hand rule would say this is positive x and this is positive y. Typically what we're going to do is use beam sign convention for this mx, which means this is a positive MX, and this is a positive MY. So in that case, this positive sign of this, this is X bar, and in this case, if this is going like this, X bar minus X, uh, so this would be, if this is MY, if we take X bar minus X, so if X is beyond the X bar, that gives us a negative sign, this would be negative for so if uh, this is larger than this, this will be positive, negative. Yeah, this would be a negative sign convention. I think what I need to do is maybe develop that a little further in your handbook. You have to really be really careful with signs. You'll see if we have this equation here. Actually, this is a little difficult to see. If our MX, this is in beam sign convention, that means that we've got compression on the top. That means a positive sign is this is Y bar. This 
MY is going to be right hand rule sign convention and therefore it's going like this. If we have a positive X, if that's larger, then that should give us compression. That's why we have a negative sign here following the same nomenclature. Okay? All right. That's basically where we are and where we're headed on this set of slides. So if we have an eccentric axial load in this particular problem, let's take a look at this guy. And we're looking for stresses at a couple points. Now the trick here is to understand what's going on. It will help if we draw this from the side. So we have a support here, we have a part that looks like this. And we're looking at the stresses right here at point A and at point B, right? Now our load is down here somewhere, P. And if we look at that, we see that that's located a distance 0.045 meters from the top of the beam. And we know that this beam is 0.024 meters. Okay, now we can see, because this is a symmetric homogeneous section, that the centroid of this is going to be at the center right here. That means that this eccentricity from here to down here, that's the eccentricity of our load. So the eccentricity of that load is going to be uh, 0.045 minus, uh, minus 0.012. You see that? Our moment is going to be, if we just redraw this, or let's uh, erase that, let's just imagine, get rid of this part to the left of here. We'll just make this part a free body diagram and ignore the rest we see this is going to be reacted with this moment here where the moment there at this at point at AB is just going to be it's just going to be P times E in the direction shown we're also going to get an axial force on this reacting like this so now we have the cross section with a A is down here and B is up here and we have a moment it's a causing like this, right? That's a negative moment because it's causing tension on the top according to beam sign convention. It's an MX, excuse me. And we have an axial load going into the page. So now our stress is going to be P over A, but that's a compressive stress, so it's negative. And then we're going to have M, and now we're going to have a Y bar minus YI to any point over I. This is MX, this is IX, and as long as this MX is using, if this is using a beam sign convention, then this will be a positive sign because this quantity here will take care of the sign. Now we can see all we have to do to calculate our stresses is plug in the Y value at point A. At point A, the Y value looks like it's a uh, if we call the bottom of this zero, then actually the Y is at zero, and at B it's at 0.024, and the Y bar is at 0.012. We can plug these values into this equation to get our stresses at each point. That's what this problem does. Let's take a look at how it is solved here. Blah, blah, blah. There's our equation. Now you'll notice whenever I'm writing this equation, I'm writing m y bar minus y over i, and I'm putting a positive sign here. This particular slide is saying, okay, it's calling it y minus y bar, so it has a negative sign. If we have a different kind of problem like this one, we have the same deal. The only trick here is now what they're saying is we have known strains. Now, in order to solve this, this is kind of a whole other class of problems. In order to solve this, we're going to do the same thing. Let's draw a free body diagram of the beam from the free end to the section cut right through here. So we have point A right there. We have point B right here. And we have this, if this is the centroid here, we have this force which is applied there, P with this eccentricity, which we're calling D in this case. So we can see this is going to be 
reacted. That moment is going to be reacted like this with this moment at A, B, and we're also going to get an axle load. Now we have an equivalent for a system. The moment at A, B is just going to be P times D in the direction shown. Now we know that the stress on this cross section, on cross section AB, is going to be P over A. That's now an axial force, a, a tensile force, so that's correct. We have an MAB. We have a Y bar minus YI and over I about the X. Now, since we're using beam sign convention, this actually is causing tension on the top. That means it's a negative moment. So we're going to have a positive sign here, but this moment, when we plug it in, we're going to be plugging in a negative moment for beam sign convention. Okay? Now, when we calculate the stresses, that means we can plug in these two positions. We can plug in the Y bar of the section, which looks like it's 0.045 meters. We can plug in the Y of point B and point A, and which mean, looks like it's at, uh, let's see, A and B. The Y location looks like B is at 0.015, and A is at point, uh, let's see, that's 0.6. I think that's 0.6. We can plug those two values in to get our stresses at those two points. The problem is we don't know what the moment is so uh, or the force, but we know what the strains are. This is like a testing problem where we actually have some kind of loading. We don't know what the loading is. We're measuring strains and we're going to get the loading. So all we got to do is go back to Hooke's Law. Remember the stress is equal to E epsilon, right? And so we can actually take that strain and say, all right, the strain is just stress over E. And because of that, or actually calculate our stress, take the EE, calculate the stress level, plug in the stress level into here, and then solve for the moment or for the axial load. Oh, now what we, it looks like we have two unknowns, but remember the axial load, the moment is just PD. If you plug PD into here, then you only have one unknown when you plug in this equation for the stress you can solve for the dimensions that it's looking for. Make sense? Now the one caveat I kind of breezed over here, we actually when we plug in this equation and this equation, we actually have two unknowns because we have both P and D unknown. The reason we can solve this now is we have two strains. So we write an equation for the, for the stress at A, we write an equation for the stress at B. We have two unknowns, P and D. We now have two equations because we knew the strain both places. That means we know the stress both places when you plug in the modulus and we can use that then with two simultaneous equations to solve for the two values. Got that? A little bit tricky, but this is the kind of stuff you will do in industry if you're doing any kind of testing. And this is what we said we were going to do. This is what we said we we're going to do. These are the equations we're going to use. And that's what I said. Comprende? Okay. All right. Now the next idea is what we're going to call unsymmetric loading. Now we're actually not going to deal with unsymmetric sections. We've actually ca calculated stresses on unsymmetric sections. But whenever we do that, we're assuming they're symmetric, which means we're ignoring the product of inertia and its effect on the stresses. That's actually commonly done in aerospace, usually through more through ignorance than through intention. But actually, due to a number of factors, it usually is close enough for government work. Now, what we're calling unsymmetric loading is a loading that's not aligned in those principal axes of the beam. Now, these beams, uh, these two cross sections are getting load in a symmetric fashion. They're loaded in a plane of symmetry in, in the major primary planes. But these two sections over to the right are loaded skewed to that. That's what we're calling an unsymmetric loading. Now, actually, the solution to these is actually much more straightforward than it looks all we have to do is go back and calculate components. So we can align this beam, say, look, here's the obvious two principal planes of the beam. All we have to do is turn this into an MX and an MY and then solve it like normal. 
draw these through the principal planes, turn this into an mx and an my, and we can solve in the normal fashion. Same thing here, take the principal axes through here, and we can go ahead and solve it. Now this one here, actually because this is unsymmetric, the principal axes are skewed. Usually for this kind of problem, we're just going to ignore the non-symmetry and proceed as if it were symmetric. Okay, now let's take a look at this a little further. Let's go ahead and take a look at a general section like this. Let's imagine that it's objected to a pure moment M as shown. That moment is going to cause stresses according to MC over I. There's still there's a stress distribution. If we look at any little increment of area, we can talk about the stress on that area. That stress acting on that area, we can turn that stress into a force by multiplying the stress by the incremental area. If we then go and sum our forces axially, we know there was no axial load applied. It was just a moment. Therefore, they should sum to zero. So all we have to do is take the stress on each little strip which means the stress times the little segment of area and summation, sum them all across that area and solve that. If we plug in our equation for stress, mc over i, then uh, we can, or we're writing it as uh, the stress is also a function of the y position relative to the maximum y position times the maximum stress on the section, we can find that actually this means that YDA is zero, which means the neutral axis passes through the centroid, and that shows us something we already knew. If we sum our moments about the Z axis, notice that the Z axis is in the direction we normally use as the X axis. We plug in our relation for the stress. We get this relation, and when we find the standard formula MC over I is what we find. And if we sum the moments about the y-axis, plugging in our stress equation, this tells us that the product of inertia is zero because this is a symmetric section. Anytime you have a loading on a symmetric section loaded along the principal axes, these will be true. Okay? And this is just the product of inertia. So what this means, let's think about this. Let's just imagine we have an L sec or a Z section that looks like this, right? If we load it in bending, this flange is going to be in compression, and this flange down here is going to be in tension, which means under a bending moment, this thing not only is going to bend like this, it's also going to twist as this flange, this flange comes this way and this flange goes this way. Because it's loaded unsymmetric, it's going to twist like this middle one here. The same thing's true for a channel section. If we load with a moment, now, we're going to see that since that has a plane of symmetry, that moment is going to cause it to rotate like this, and it's also going to cause it to, uh, but, but that won't be twisting like the other one, because the other section uh, was loaded in a non-symmetric plane, just loading with a moment will tend to twist that. Same thing's true here with an angle. If we apply a moment, it's going to push this here and pull this out, which is going to tend to roll that section. That's because the product inertia is not zero for that one, okay? This slide here, this is showing another moment that's not loaded along. Now, this, this material has a plane of symmetry, but this moment is not in that plane of symmetry. The easiest way to solve this is to resolve this moment into two components, one about the z-axis and one about the y-axis. We then write our equation for the stress using my over i and mx over i. And after we have computed the two relative moments. So we take a look at this, we see that this moment here, I will draw it larger, you see that we have this moment here. This means what we have here is we have a component m about the z and we have a component m about the y. So we change the moment that was applied into those two components. We then write our stress equation. Our stress is equal to m uh, z, and this is this is measuring y and z from the neutral surface, the centroidal axis. So m y, if we have that moment, and this is m about the z in this case, this is i about the z, and we have the y here, but the y dimension, which is going like this from the centroid, if we have a positive mz according to the 
uh, according to this nomenclature, it's both the right hand rule and beam sign convention because it's causing compression on the top. If we have a positive one, it's going to give us a negative stress. So my over I. And then we also have a moment about the y axis, and that's going to be over IY. And then we're going to have, that means if we have a positive Z, that's going to be tension. So this is going to be positive if we have a positive Z value. That's what we're seeing here, the same thing. Okay? So with that said, we're starting to get probably a little more familiar with that kind of nomenclature. We then can see if we then look for where the neutral axis is. Now, if we want to know, remember the neutral axis defined is the surface that has no stress. We started out when we bent the beam, we looked at that middle surface, that neutral surface. That's what the radius of curvature was measured to. So at the neutral surface uh, or the neutral axis, the stress is zero. So we can just plug in a zero for the stress and calculate the Y and the Z location of the neutral surface. And it's going to be a line of the beam. So plugging that in, we get this and we find this relation down here, y over z is equal to the iz over the iy times tangent of theta and that's equal to tangent of phi. So remember, phi is the angle of the load itself, right? So if, if I turn my annotation back on, we see that phi is the angle, remember the moment was at this, excuse me, the moment was at this angle theta, right? That's how we got our components. So that's the theta, and phi is the angle of the neutral axis. So we're going to find this relation. So we can plug in any point on the thing, any point, any yz coordinates, and this relation, if we take the iz over the iy times tangent of the angle of what the loading was at, that will give us the tangent of the phi. This means we can solve this for what the angle of the neutral axis is. And if you look at this carefully, you find that if this phi is larger than theta, that phi is larger than theta uh, whenever iz, the moment of inertia about this, is larger than iy. What that means is the new, so if you imagine, okay, we have this section and we have the centroidal axis, and we have some kind of moment applied to the thing. And this moment makes an angle theta. Whichever i is larger. So we've got an i about the z and an i about the y. i about the z resists this kind of bending. i about the y resists this kind of bending. Whichever one is larger is going to tend to push the neutral axis away. So if the moment about the z is larger, then it's going to tend to push this angle phi, which is measured from the same place, is going to move away from the stiffer section. If this other one about the y were larger, it would have pushed that angle the other direction. But we get all this from this equation, excuse me, this equation right down here. Okay? So what this slide says is, now if you don't understand that, that's okay. Uh, this is just, if you understand what this green statement says, it will make you a stronger master of this. All you really need to do is turn your moment into two components and then analyze for the stresses. If I ask you for the angle of the neutral axis, you can just plug into this equation down at the bottom. Or if I ask you any or, more information about like where the intercepts of that are or something. Okay, that's all we need to do with that one. So if we have a general case of axial loading, if we see this loading here, we see, let's just take a moment to annotate this. Glancing at this, we immediately see this force is not at the centroid, which is obviously here. Therefore, what this is going to do is we have two eccentricities. We have this eccentricity A and this eccentricity B. If you just focus on this eccentricity A, we see that force times A is causing this MY. So my is equal to pa in this case. And this force times this eccentric cb is going to give us a moment like this, mz. That's our mz in this case. If we wanted stresses based on this, we would say our stress is equal to p over a. That's a tension stress. We've got mz 
over z, i z, excuse me, we've got m y over i y. Remember these subscripts are always the same. And now we're going to need m z times, and if we measure from the bottom here for our coordinate system, then we would see this m z. If we're up above, it should be negative, so y bar minus y i, right? measuring from any coordinate system. If you start with a centroid and that y bar is just a zero, this is a, a positive moment for that sign convention and also for right hand rule in this particular case. So that means if we're up above, we should see compression in this case. If we're up above, we should see compression. So this is a positive sign. And this one, m y over i, we're going to put in a z here. This is going to be z bar minus z. And what that means is this moment, if we go Z bar is wherever that is. And if we're out beyond it, now this is beyond it. This should be a positive here. Because uh, if Z bar minus Z, if Z is this side, if Z is greater, if Z is greater than Z bar, let's see, pause. Z bar is here. This is kind of... Uh, weird nomenclature because of the way I drew this. Let's just call this uh, Z from the centroidal axis. If we use Z from the centroidal axis, if it's positive, we're going to expect this to be a positive stress. And if we plug in a Y from the centroidal axis, if it's positive, it will give us a negative stress in that case, which our other sign convention was taking care of. Let's erase this stuff and that's what we see here. Make sense? Okay. Here's some example problems. This is a little ring, a uh, little cut ring. We can see looks like the loads are aligned but if you cut this right here what we end up with is a half ring like this. We have a force here P it's going to have to be reacted like this P and we see that this moment is going to cause a reactive moment here which is equal to P times 0.65 it looks like. See that? And then we can analyze that cross section. Blah blah blah. This is our basic approach. Next slide, we'll solve it. We've got a P over A kind of stress and an MC over I kind of stress. We superimpose the two. That gives us the total stress on the section. And we could draw that stress if we needed to. Make sense? Here's another little example. You can see here, once again, that this loading is not the centroid. Now, what we would have to do is make a cross section through here and draw it and calculate the section properties to find where the centroidal axis is. Then we note that actually this force is applied down here at point D and our centroidal axis is up here. That means our reaction, if we take a look at this like this, we have the force applied down here, but the centroid is right up here. Actually, let's draw the force over here. That means at the centroid, get rid of this guy. At the centroid, we're going to be reacting it and we're going to be reacting it where this moment is just P times this distance, which is uh, going to be Y bar minus 0.016, right? That's going to be our moment. And then we can write our stresses. The stress on that section will be negative P over A, since that's a negative uh, force. We're going to have M. And now if our Y is calculated from down here, uh, this would be a negative moment because it's uh, this is a negative moment because it's uh, not following sign convention. It's got tension on the top. So, but if it had a positive moment, then it would be y bar minus y over i, and this would be a positive. But then we plug in this moment. This is a negative moment, which goes here. Actually, we can put a positive here, and then we just plug in this force. This force is negative, and this moment should be negative, and then everything will come out in the wash as shown here.
blah, blah, blah. That's what we're going to do. Bang, pop, pow. Make sense? Okay. Here's another one. This is quite simple. All we need to do is just turn this into two components. We can turn this in to uh, the hardest part of this is using trig to calculate what this rotation is. Uh, and once you've done that, you just see we're going to get these two components. We see that this angle is 30. That means this angle is 30, which means this angle is 30, right? If this rotated 30 out, then that rotated 30 up. This is the same 30 degrees. All we need is this and this component. And then we're home free solving. We've got two moments to evaluate, no axial load. Here's a basic solution procedure. Let me erase the ink on the slide before moving on. And here is how that is done. Got it? Here's how we draw that. Okay, so that's all we've got. In lecture nine, we looked at bending of a symmetric section. We focused mostly on bending about one axis, usually about the x-axis. Okay, homogeneous section. In lecture 10, we looked at when we have multiple materials or composite sections, the same kind of approach. In this last lecture, we looked a little closer when we have multiple moments and axial loads, and we looked at when we have a non-symmetric moment. These are three building blocks of structural analysis that you will use a lot in industry. Make sure you master this, spend the time on the homework to nail it. If you have a Beer and Johnson or a Hibbler or any other elementary strength text, they have a lot of information on this with a lot of examples. I encourage you to read those and try some of those examples in addition to our homework. Enjoy.